I'm Mike Burrell, Summit Life, Chadwick Ram, and Legacy Member of Wild Sheep Foundation. I'm your host for this seminar. The purpose is to enjoy fun and funny experiences from, our, from the organization's most experienced and colorful icons, mountain sheep and goat hunters. Uh, this is intended for enjoyment and inspiration. Our first four accomplished and colorful icons uh, bring a, a wealth of experience, uh, both in North America as well as internationally. And uh, I'd like to introduce them to you. Uh, we'll do it from left to right uh, on your screen as, they, as they're showing up. Tom Hoffman lives in Albany, New York. He's 77 years old, but refuses to act it. I think every, all of us who know him would acknowledge that. He became addicted to sheep hunting in 1971, 50 years ago. He's been on roughly 70 sheep and goat hunts. He started bow hunting in 1985, and that's when the serious addiction started. He supports uh, his sheep hunting addiction by washing cars. Uh, he started his family business in 1965 with uh, a coin operated car wash. It's since grown to uh, 25 locations and over 700 team members. Uh, hunting recognitions include four archery grand slams, Ovis World Slam Archery, Capra World Slam Archery, Archery Super Slam, which are all Pope and Young, pretty impressive. I've often referred to Tom to others as what I believe is one of the best ambassadors for hunting, certainly bow hunting, but really all hunting overall. So please, uh, please acknowledge Tom Hoffman. Uh, next on the screen is Gary Young. Gary lives in, in West By God, Virginia. His first sheep hunt was the year 2000 for doll sheep in the Northwest Territory with Arctic Red. He's, he's done 65 sheep and goat hunts. Uh, his recognition includes Outstanding Hunter Award from Dallas Safari Club in 2014, two Grand Slams, Super 20 sheep, uh, as well as goats. North American 29, he's uh, also done the Big Five and the Dangerous Seven. Uh, he's a life member and Marco Polo Society member for the Sheep Foundation. A little known fact, he bought two dozen traps when he was nine years old and with some instruction from his uh, great grandfather started a trap line. And he did that uh, clear up until he was 35 years old. Uh, even he was an instructor in the uh, trappers education class in West Virginia. Uh, he says he's a redneck country boy, but I'll let you make that, uh, make that determination. <laughs> Got a great trophy room behind him there. Next over is Bob Logan. Bob lives in uh, Alberta. His home is Alberta, maybe it's a better way to say it. And when he's in Alberta, uh, seven months of the year, he splits time between uh, a home in Calgary and a farm in Northwest Alberta. And the other five months of the year, he spends in Mesa, Arizona, uh, mainly golfing and doing sporting clays down there. His first sheep was a doll from the Northwest Territory, 1979. And, uh, and it was a backpack trip and the, the entire cost was $2,500. Uh, I'm telling you, I almost gag on that, but, uh, but great deal, right? He's hunted 52 sheep, 20 goats, and he's done 173 big game hunts. Recognition wise, uh, uh, completed a Grand Slam 1986, Super Slam uh, from, uh, that's the Isha Award, 1991, Ovis Super 30, Triple Slam in 2010, uh, Capra Super 20, uh, the Wild Sheep, well, he was a Wild Sheep Foundation Mountain Hunter Hall of Fame uh, uh, technology in 2016. And he's a Summit Life member of the Sheep Foundation and an interesting fact is that he's very detail oriented and keeps notes on everything, which is often to the uh, disgruntlement of people he hunts with. <laughs> they may wish he didn't remember everything. The, uh, on the far right, 
uh, is Rennie Snyder, Elk Grove, California. Uh, Rennie grew up in the mountains of uh, Idaho, central Idaho, along the Salmon River. Her parents were both outdoors, uh, enjoyed the outdoors, and her father was an avid and skilled outdoorsman. And as a child, she certainly accompanied them on their outdoor excursions. Uh, be it fishing, hunting, sleighing, or just, just enjoying a Jeep ride in the, in the mountains. Her outdoor skills were honed uh, during, during her early years. At the same time, she gained a deep respect uh, for the solace of being in the outdoors. Rennie has hunted every continent and has been recognized with virtually all of the world's most prestigious hunting awards, including the Weatherby Award. She's collected 43 ovus and 40 capra species. 1995 stone sheep was her first sheep. Uh, she's highly accomplished and respected hunter conservationist, a generous philanthropist, and a beloved humanitarian. So please welcome our four icons. I'd like to start us off with the first question I'm gonna ask uh, several of them to respond to. And that is, what is your funniest personal experience on a sheep or goat hunt? And I'd like to start with you, Bob Logan. I think the funniest one was back first trip where I took Ron and Carrie over to Mongolia. We got her hunting done and got invited to a party, which is a birthday party for the oldest guy in the valley. And we got to sit by the old guy. And the celebration started with a port a big bowl of kumis the fermented bear's milk, and handed it to Ron first. And of course, he just drank the bowl. <laughs> Took it back and refilled it. He did the same. And I finally, I'd, I'd read a book re before we left, some of the traditions. And I said, Ron, you're supposed to take a sip and pass the bowl around. This stuff has got dirt and everything in it. But anyway, we got it straightened out. There was a good chuckle over it. Very good. Thanks, Bob. Tom Hoffman, how about you? Oh, one of my funny stories, I've got several down here, but uh, in 1974, I had a hunt book in Alberta for bighorn sheep for $850 with a guy named Bill Mikowski, and he was 100% successful, but the government changed zones and, and uh, he got put out of business. And I, so I asked him, is there anyone that you would suggest for me to go with? Well, there's this guy, Dave Simpson. He said, I heard he may have one permit left. So I was, this was only my second sheep hunt. So I wrote Dave a letter and I'm not much of a letter writer, but I hand printed a little letter to Dave Simpson asking if I could get his permit. And uh, his wife tells a story. She still has the letter, by the way. It's kind of interesting. And uh, she, um, read Dave, she read all these letters. She had like 10 letters from all kinds of attorneys and doctors and fancy letters. And mine is just a little tiny thing, but it had a little humor in the back page. It's, you know, the beginning of it said, I want to go sheep hunting real bad and willing to work hard for a ram. And anyway, I put a little humor on the back. So he, Carol flips it over and reads my little joke. So Dave's watching hockey, which he did quite often laying in a living room and he read uh, Carol reads the letter to him and what it said the little humor if a male sheep is a ram and a donkey is an ass how come a ram in the ass is a goose and Dave laughed and he says book him cool. now I've been 29 times with the Simpson family ever since uh, so I've got this very very special bond with the with the Simpsons but then they're uh, just great people. That's one of my humor stories. And Dave was sort of a mentor. That's why I think uh, Rini's nicknamed me Goofy. And I think my mentor was Dave Simpson. Thanks, Tom. Gary, how about you? I think you've got uh, something about a Jay, Jay Molinar and maybe an Alex Bibber. I don't know whether that's one or two <laughs> different uh, funny stories. Oh, thank you, Mike. Back in 2004, when my son graduated from college, my gift to him was a doll sheep hunt uh, up in the Arctic with Arctic Red in the Northwest Territories. 
And I had hunted up there on my first sheep hunt four or five years prior to that. Tavis Molnar had been my guide, who now owns and operates Arctic Red. But he and his brother Jay, both of them were studs when it comes to climbing those mountains. They would hurt you bad. <laughs> On the first day of our sheep hunt from our spike camp in the valley down on the river, we spotted a really nice ram. And of course, I wanted my son to have an opportunity at that first ram. To get to that ram, we had to cross an Arctic glacier fed river. And it was running quite hard. So all of us had pretty heavy packs. Uh, Tavis took the lead and I followed him, my son behind. Jay was bringing up the rear. Uh, we heard a, a funny sound and turned just in time to see Jay do a 360 degree pirouette and disappeared in the middle of the river with terrible uh, currents. And of course, it, it, it was frightening at the time, but we jumped in, managed to get a hold of him and drag, drag him out. But we had to strip him down, build a fire, dry everything out. But after we got him off, cleaned up and dried out, then it was an everyday constant laugh the rest of the hunt. But uh, that was crazy. And then another time at Arctic Red, I had the, the privilege of sitting in the base camp literally all night long when, when the, the famous legend Alex Van Bibber was living. Uh, we sat and listened to that guy all night long. It was five, six o'clock in the morning. He survived three plane crashes, kept the doctor and his wife alive, but he kept us in stitches. Someone, I think there is a book about him, but Alex Van Bibber was a legend up there. And if anyone ever has a chance to refer to him or gain, gain information, he's phenomenal. Thank you, Gary. And uh, those of us that were at, I'm not sure which year it was, uh, the Sheep Show, Alex Van Bibber was, uh, was recognized that on the stage and he had the entire place uh, almost in tears laughing at him. So I'd like to move to the next question. And it's, it, it's similar, but it's uh, what's the funniest guide client story you've experienced or know from someone else? Randy, why don't you start us off? I think you've got an interesting one of, uh, of seven weeks with Wang Wei. Uh, yeah. Wang Wei is a wonderful man, and I hunted seven weeks with him in China. And he speaks with a broken English accent, so you have to listen to him to understand what he's saying. But he was an excellent guy, and he has a delightful personality. And we were I was going for the dwarf blue sheep. And so we climbed and climbed and climbed and we were right on the border with Tibet, right on the border. And there was a river dividing the countries and we were on the China side, but he, you know, you could have crossed the river and been in Tibet. So we were climbing and climbing and it was, very, it was steep enough that we couldn't set up a tent. We each had, a, the two of us had a one man tent and um, it, there was no place to set up a tent because it was too steep. So we kept, we had to keep climbing and climbing and there's yak poop everywhere. And so I saw a place that I thought, you know, I can, I could actually sleep here. So I stopped and I had the guy that was packing my little tent stop with me, but Wong Wei kept climbing. And as he kept climbing, he was quite a ways above me. And then he hollered, uh, you know, down, down that mountain to me and said, you, keep climbing there's it's more level here and we'll it's very rocky and we'll just clear the rocks away as best we can and we'll set up your tent here and i i hollered back up the mountain no thank you i found a place and it was not level but i knew it was level enough for me i said i would rather sleep down here in the yak poop than up there in the rocks. And so we laughed about that. And I did. That's where I set up my tent. And it was just an extraordinary hunt, the, the, the whole hunt. Great. Thanks, Rennie. 
Uh, Gary, how about uh, how about your story uh, with Art Billadou? Billadou. Oh, in two thousand and three, my one of my best hunting buddies in the world, Chris Leverage, and I. He, Chris is from Aspen, Colorado, and I booked a hunt um, up in the Yukon. It was the last year, I believe, that Ross Peck operated at the time Larry Warren was uh, running his operations, and he now owns and operates uh, the Chody River. At the time, it was, it was uh, Ross Peck, but one of our guides we chris and i have made it a point to stay together while we're hunting so we can experience two kills hopefully on each hunt and just just the company of each other so cal lacy art billado and i set out on our third what turned out to be a 13-day stone sheep hunt well, art was a fireman paramedic uh, there out of dc and those guys apparently have too much time on their hands but he kept us in stitches the whole time. But one, one of the stories that stuck out the most in my mind, they had a repeat hunter that came in. He was an older gentleman from Georgia, came into camp, and several of the guides had had some pretty un, uncomfortable uh, hunts with him. He was apparently very demanding, put a lot of pressure on the guys. So Art, being the gentleman and easygoing guy he was, Larry Warren came to him and said, would you guide this guy? So he agreed to do it. Well, when they get into camp, this gentleman from Georgia refuses to leave the camp. So Art proceeds to threaten him. He, he threatened him. He begged him, pleaded with him. And finally, the guy sits down and he says to Art, he said, look, I've been there. I've done it. For the next 14 days, I want you to tell me stories, do a little cooking for me, and chew my tobacco. For the next 14 days, Art and this gentleman from Georgia sat in camp and he cooked, told him stories, chewed his tobacco. And when they got back into camp, of course, he was unsuccessful. But he proceeded to let the Warrens know that it was the best hunt he'd ever had in his life. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Tom, how about you? Well, a guide I'm, client story. In the, uh, it's a guide, a guide hunter story that I was hunting in the Yukon and uh, went to town to the Wilkinsons. They uh, run an uh, outfit near in Watson Lake. And uh, we were having lunch and there was a young native guide that's probably in his thirties. He said, uh, Ruth Wilkinson said to this young man, tell Tom about uh, the Chuck Yeager story. And you know, Chuck Yeager is a very famous person. And uh, so this young man said, oh yeah, my uncle guided Chuck Yeager. And his uncle was a mountain man, never went to town, knew nothing about history. And no, but uh, Chuck Yeager and uh, the young, the older native man, the guide sitting around a campfire. And uh, Chuck says, do you know who I am? And the guide said, what you mean? He says, do you know who I am? And the guide, the, the native guide said, yeah, you Chuck Yeager. No, 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 do you know what I've done? And the, the native man says, what you mean? Chuck Yeager says, well, I'm the first man to break the sound barrier. Oh, the native man looked at the fire. He said, oh, I broke axe sandal last week. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you hear some wild things in the, in the far north. Uh, thanks, Tom. I love it. <laughs> Okay, now I think it's a safe assumption that all four of you have sheep fever. So my question is, how would you describe it? And Gary, why don't you start us off on this one? Oh boy. <laughs> it's hard to put it into words, Mike, or hard to describe. It's sort of like that first date with your wife. <laughs> but, or your wife-to-be. It's, it's somewhat of a disease that basically feeds your wild nature and, and a desire to go into some of the most remote places on earth, the difficult places. Uh, 
in pursuit of some of God's most beautiful create create creatures. It's just it's hard to describe, but it's it's a motivator, and you're either in or out. There's no in between. Thanks, Gary. Bob, how about you on uh, how do you describe sheep fever, your sheep fever? Well, it's just like that, that first sheep on the trip, you either like it or hate it. And uh, but if you like it, you're in trouble. You got it. And it just bleeds from one to the other. I can't say much else on particular, but I know what quite a few of them and always look forward to the next one. Absolutely. Thanks, Bob. Rennie, sheep fever. Well, I would agree. It, number one, it's very difficult uh, and it's personal to express, but I think that uh, it, it's true. You go on your first sheep hunt, and I was very apprehensive on mine for a lot of reason, never being on a sheep hunt. I knew it would be difficult horseback riding, and uh, that made me very nervous. And, and after being on the hunt, rightfully so, it was a treacherous uh, horseback ride when I was on horses before I could actually start climbing. But I think Bob was right in exactly that statement. You either love it or you hate it. And for me, it was just the challenge of proving to myself that I could do it. They're magnificent, magnificent animals. And I think for those of us who challenge ourselves, it's a matter of, can I really do it? Because I've been in, at the bottom of many mountains wondering how I'm ever going to get to the top. And when I get to the top and I get my shape, and I've been on a lot of hunts where I don't get the trophy, but it still has been a very successful hunt to me because I personally was able to do it. As long as we've all worked hard, I, I think that's what it's all about. I love nature. I love being out in nature. I love being part of nature. And I, it's just fun to see them. It's all about skill and talent. And you see the wariness and the, the wiseness of the wildlife, the beauty of the, the mountains. And I think that's what keeps drawing us back. It, it's really is truly an addiction. Thanks, Renny. I, the next question I've got for you is, uh, is a request to tell us about the strangest meal you've eaten or been offered uh, in a sheep camp. And uh, Bob, I'd like to start with you. Well, we know it has to be from China because they eat everything. The only place I've ever hunted were even the bloodshot lungs in the stew pot. But the funniest one, Ron and I were over there and they came out with a like little place like the kids had all the dividers in them. One was worms and bugs and the other one salamanders, lizards and various things. These were the samplers for us to try and see what we wanted to order. And it took quite a few glasses of their mouth to try some of them. <laughs> did, did you pick one of those, one or more? We tried quite a few actually. And snake was one of the better ones. <laughs> Good for you. Oh my. Rennie, how about you and the uh, strangest, strangest meal? Actually, I've had a lot of strange meals when I've been out on hunts, but the one that would come foremost into my mind was in Mongolia. I had come back into camp and I went into my tent, but there was a marmot laying there. And I had said to the guide, I'd love that skin. It's a beautiful skin. And I said, I'll pay for it. And, but I'd love to take the skin home because it was just a marmot and somebody had shot it while I was out hunting. <clears throat> so I went in to get my knife and I came back out of my tent and he actually was uh, singeing off the hair with a blowtorch. And I went, wait, wait, I wanted the skin. And he said, no, this is our dinner. And that's what they do. They singe off the hair. They don't they don't gut it, they do nothing, they just stuff it full of hot hot rocks. <laughs> when the rocks are heated, of course, from the the act chips that they burn, that's their firewood because there is no wood. So I had to eat the marmot and uh, it's quite a delicacy to them. I didn't care for it, but it's quite a delicacy uh, to the Mongolian people. 
that was rather strange to me. Well, thanks, Rennie. I, I also remember that the, the first time I sat around a ring, when they brought the marmot out, they gave each of us a glass. And I was trying to think what the glass was for. Maybe they were going to pour something to drink, you know, to help us manage the eating the marmot. But they, after, after we'd taken the, the bigger chunks out, they lifted up and, and poured liquid fat into each of our glasses so that we could drink that. Yum. <laughs> okay, so uh, Gary, how about you telling us? I think you've got, uh, you got a story from Mongolia too, don't you? I do, and Randy, we don't call them marmots, we call them groundhogs here in West Virginia, and I've eaten my share, especially when I was younger. <laughs> My story is from Mongolia, Mike. Uh, in 2008, I was on a hunt over there. Uh, had been down to the Gobi area and through the Hungai area. And late in the day, uh, I think we're 12, 13 days into the hunt, I, I had shot um, a Hungai uh, Argali sheep. And it was dark when we actually got to it. So the, the guys actually packed the entire animal back to our camp. And while we were scanning it with the interpreter, I sort of jokingly mentioned bull fries and in the process mentioned the sheep testicles, how good they really might be in, in a joking manner. Well, the next morning, when my breakfast plate showed up in the GER, I had two eggs and two sheep testicles still whole boiled on my plate. Well, not to let them down, I did put both those sheep testicles away. <laughs> and uh, I had gotten tired of eating by myself. So I told the interpreter, I'm coming to your to eat for tonight. Well, the meals that they were serving me were definitely different than what they had. When I got there, they had a huge pot on the yak dung heating stove full of nothing but cheap bones. In the floor, they had a big rock and a hammer, and we proceeded to take turns on the rock with the hammer, cracking cheap bones and sucking bone marrow. <laughs> That's my story. Uh, it was... Thanks, Gary. Tom, I think you might have more than one, right? Yeah, I've got several of them, but uh, the one that is actually my favorite meal on a mountain is uh, sheep backstrap cooked on a one burner stove with a flat rock. And uh, that was up in Ramhead Outfitters. Tim Stevenson, I've never seen it done before. This is about 1987, and uh, it was the most incredible, especially after eating day after day, you know, mountain house. Uh, those sheep back straps were incredible. He had a little salt and pepper. He put it on the rock with that sheep meat. Oh, baby. And I know everyone here <laughs> has had that, but uh, it was incredible. My most unusual was uh, with Dave Simpson, uh, it was about the 20, it was a 21 day hunt. I hunted 21 days, went home. Dave says, come on back in two weeks. I didn't shoot a sheep. This 1974. And he had a native guide and I was so sick of peanut butter and jelly uh, sandwiches made of pancake with a pancake rolled up with peanut butter and jelly. And I'm watching this native man with a brown paper bag eating this meat and it looked awesome. And I, his name was Rod Moberly, native man. And I said, Rod, what is that? Porcupine. And I said, could I try a piece? Oh, okay. And he gave me a little chunk and I put it in my mouth. It was the foulest tasting thing to this day I've ever had in my mouth. And it was because they, they killed this porcupine with a rock, threw it in an open fire, quills, hair, guts and all, rolled it around and then took the meat off of it the next morning and it looked great, but it was foul. But I've had seal intestine on a, on a, a point. A lot of strange stuff, but it's all good. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. So, so I know that most of, 
uh, most of uh, everyone is going to think that these guys are all, uh, you know, crack shots, never miss, uh, what have you. But turns out just pretty much everybody's got a, you know, a, an agonizing mi miss, miss somewhere in their history. So this question is to tell us about your most agonizing miss. And Tom, let's start with you. Okay. Well, it was in Spain. I was bow hunting for um, Ibex. I think it was a Southern Ibex. And I'm with a guide that they spotted the biggest one. He said, this is the biggest sheep I've ever seen or uh, biggest Ibex. So we did a stalk on it and the, he led the way and did a great job with the stalk. And, and I had what I consider a chip shot. It was probably 15 to 17 yards right over the edge of a cliff. And I drew back and I stepped up and and I shot and the arrow hit the edge of the cliff about four feet in front of the bow. The arrow just smashed and the Ibex ran off and he went out about 60 yards and stood there broadside for the longest time then wandered off. But I, oh, it was agonizing. And I, I felt so bad for the guide. Um, also, I've, I felt many, many times bad for guides because um, my first sheep hunt, I hunted three years and I missed 12 shots in three years and finally got a bighorn sheep. But it's, it's painful for the guides to get you in range and then you blow it with a bow. And like Rini said, we've been on a lot of hunts where we come home empty handed, but it's all part of it. So the love of the, love of the chase. Absolutely. I was uh, pheasant hunting not too long ago and, uh, and, and missed uh, missed what should have been a pretty easy double and the dog turns around and <laughs> gives me the evil eye. <laughs> okay, so uh, Gary, tell us uh, something about a hailstorm, Ram? Uh, this was, would have been Mike, uh, my second sheep hunt in 2001. I actually had been putting in for some time, having been encouraged my, by my friend, Chris Leverage in Colorado and I drew an archery bighorn tag down in the San Gray de Cristos. And of course, most of uh, people here in this group realize and understand how big those mountains are. And we were near the Crestone Peak areas. The first morning in camp, I hired Rudy Rudaball, who was a legend from Parlin to pack us in down there. I took my son, Chris, and then he had his stepdaughter as a cook. But from camp, we spotted a, a bighorn on the skyline. Well, that afternoon, midday, we got on four bighorn rams. The problem was they were about 180 yards below us. And Rudy and I stalked down. And like Tom mentioned just a minute ago, we ended up sitting on a rock ledge and the sheep were finally got up and started feeding tortoise. We sat on that rock ledge for three hours and basically with no cover, motionless. In the process, both my legs went to sleep. I couldn't feel my legs. Well, finally, the biggest ram got up to within about 50 yards. And when I finally drew on the sheep, on the ram, unbeknown to me, the cam on the bottom of my bow must have been so close to the rocks that when I released the arrow, the cam hit and the arrow went like six or eight inches over the ram's back. And my, my son and Chris were videoing all this. Well, the good part of the story is, I'll make it quick. I missed the ram that day, but seven days later, we had spotted the same ram we climbed back up, Rudy and I did, spotted the sheep. He rigged me up a, a, a pine bough thing to push in front of me, and I crawled over 400 yards and got close to these same four rams again. Well, it come a storm, and I know y'all have all seen these, these hail storms and lightning thunder. It was so bad, Rudy had left behind me. He went back to camp, but I stayed. The hailstorm came up and actually gave me the cover that I needed to slip down and get within 22 yards of these four sheep bedded. 
and I killed that ram on the seventh day of the hunt. Uh, it was it was the lowest and highest that you uh, we as uh, we all as mountain hunters could ever imagine to happen on my second hunt, and it still sticks out as one of the best experiences. And of course, added to my sheep fever. <laughs> Bob, God, how about you talk to us about your Marco Polo experience, your first one? I was back in '74. Ron and I booked a. Marco Polo and the Caragandra hunt back to back. So we had limited days. We got down there in Tajikistan. The snow was very deep and we got on some rams three, four days into the hunt. And I got first shot and I missed. There's been a few of those. But anyway, a little uh, get you upset, especially Ron got one later. Then we had to leave, so I was leaving there without a ram. Back to Moscow and off to Karaganda, where we both collected nice rams. Come back into Moscow and Sergey with Safari Outfitters, and we've always been 100%. We'd like you to go back down there, give you another hunt, just for the cost of the local airfare. I couldn't say no, that sheep fever, you know. So Ron took my Karaganda sheep, went home. I went down there without an interpreter, my visa had expired, but Sergey just changed the numbers in it. When I got to Tajikistan, they asked me about these changes. I said, Moscow, didn't know. They let me in, I went in, I got my sheep, but that it was a five and a half week trip. And uh, I wish I'd hit that first one and hadn't missed it. Thanks, Bob. So, so this next, uh, next question uh, is a little different and and it's really asking for the, uh, the your experience here what wisdom would you share uh, with sheep hunting fans that are in the either the less than one club or the less than one international club and Rennie how about you starting us off I think my advice would be for people that don't know me uh, is that I always wanted to be a sheep hunter and I, I would have friends and say that knew I hunted, hunted here in North America, hunted in Africa. And I said, but I'm a sheep hunter. At heart, I am a sheep hunter. But my husband was not and said, I'm not ever going to hunt sheep. So therefore you are never going to hunt sheep. But in 1995 was my first sheep and that was a stone sheep. And that was life changing for me and it took me years to get to that point to where I even did get to go on my very first sheep hunt it's immediately addictive it was such a challenge it was so difficult for me but it was so much fun and I took a magnificent sheep but I think the bottom line is you never give up you don't give up you you know I wanted to go for many many years thought I would never get to do that and I finally did and then I really did get going on my sheep hunting because it was a dream come true for me and I was lucky enough to be married to a man who objected at first but then did support me so that I could at least follow my dreams which I appreciated very very much so you just can't you can't give up even when you're standing at the bottom of the mountain and you're looking up and you think I don't know how many times I've said I don't know how I'm going to get to the top of this but you know you do you just I remember saying that once to a guide on a a hunt and the sheep was so many miles away on so many ridges between us that we'd seen a, a nice sheep and the spotting scope at the top of another ridge and I said I just don't know how we can get there and he turned gave me this look like he couldn't believe I'd said it he said we get there by putting one foot in front of the other and I thought yes that was a fairly simple solution packed up his spotting scope and off we went and you know, it took us just a little while and, the, and there we were. And I thought, you know, you just can't give up. You've got to give it all you've got and you'll get there. Thank you, Rennie. Tom, how about you? What about, what advice would you give sheep hunting fans that are less than one? Oh, one thing for sure, go join the Wild Sheep Organization. Be sure to go to every convention, go to every seminar. It's all about networking and finding out the best place to go, uh, how to do it and so on. But um, the price of hunts has skyrocketed and it seems crazy, but years ago in 1972, I hunted with Gary Powell 
in British Columbia. I had seven tags, including stone sheep, $2,400, 18 days, you know, back in the old days. Now, there's something interesting that I heard just, I don't know, five or 10 years ago that the price of a stone sheep hunt is very similar to the price of a good pickup truck. Back in those days, a good pickup truck was $2,400. You know, mm. we know what a good pickup truck costs today, about the same as a stone sheep, which is kind of interesting. But I've got a friend that, uh, Mark Gutzmettler, he's from Wisconsin. And he's a working guy. He installs carpet as, as his main job but he's a muskrat trapper. 2011, the price of muskrats was over $10 a pelt. He caught 5,400 muskrats mm -hmm. and bought a couple of sheep hunts, including a stone sheep. But that's what it takes. And uh, save your money and uh, you know get sheep fever. But that's just a, another little story about uh, what it costs and the determination of sheep hunting. But Mark uh, is doing it again right now. He's got a lot of muskrats caught, but the price <laughs> isn't quite as good as it used to be. Anyway, uh, like Greeny said, sheep fever is an addicting thing. Thank you, Tom. Gary, what do you have to say about uh, advice? Well, I would second everything that, that Greeny and Tom have said. Uh, sheep hunting's certainly different, much different than sitting in a tree stand hunting whitetails. You're either in or you're out because it takes so much effort on, on the guides, the outfitters, all the support team, the pilots, and the organizations to promote the sport. I mean, it's, it's essentially the pinnacle of the hunting, the hunting world. And you have to decide whether you're in or out. You're committed or you're not. There's no middle ground. You've got to be physically willing to make the challenge. You have to be mentally. And I think half of the game, just like football, being a linebacker, you've got to have the mental capacity to get in there and play the game because those guys work their tails off. I've seen some of those poor guys, their, their shoes are falling off their feet where they've walked so hard and, and it's not fair to them to not be prepared uh, like tom said join the wild sheep and the other organizations the nra to, to support them i think uh, get your priorities in order uh once you get into it it's nothing it's not a game that you can pick up and just go tomorrow you have to plan ahead put your bucket list together decide what animals you want to focus on and in what order and educate yourself and the, the conventions with wild sheep are one of the best places in the world learn your guides your outfitters uh, check their references and one of the best places too to get refer referrals is from those of us and uh, tom rainy uh i've picked their brain multiple times and had the pleasure of sitting in Petro Pavlovsk with Bob and in Anchorage, Alaska. We've shared some meals and some great stories and they'll point you, these, these people that have been around will point you the right direction. Thanks, Gary. Speaking of finding Bob in various places, I ran into him <laughs> in Turkey a couple years ago. <laughs> Bob, you, you know, you ever stay home? No. Oh. So. So next, uh, Bob, would you share share your wisdom for the less than one folks? Well, I think they should go out there. They're, go, they're booking a sheep hunt, but go out there looking for an experience, especially an international. It's the, the sheep is anticlimactic once you get it. Go there, enjoy the country, see the sites, meet the people. Uh, we've always booked 10 day, two week, three week trips. And never once have we came back before the end of the trip. We shot around on the second day, have a choice of going home or going looking at some new sheep territory, see some new people, new country. If you don't get one, which happens on occasion, uh, still enjoy the experience. Say you had a good time. I'd like an open mind. Just don't go up there to kill a sheep. 
Mark, check off another one off the list and go home. Let Thanks, make a lifetime and enjoy it. Great advice from, from all four of you. I, I want a, a really special thank you to all four for being willing to do this. And, uh, and I think it's going to turn out to be quite a fun seminar. We'll, we'll let the uh, Sheep Foundation uh, members and registrants uh, uh, give us a read on that. It is going to be run on Saturday. I think it's one o'clock, I forget, but it's on the schedule. And uh, I don't know what else to say other than just a really special thank you. If we were in a, a, a ballroom, uh, I'm confident there would be a heck of a round of applause for, for all four of you. And I'm honored uh, to be able to be, to, you know, to uh, have hosted this effort. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll call this a, a wrap for today. Thank, thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Mike, thanks for doing it. If I can, I'd like to just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mike Burrell. Uh, I'm a Summit Life Chadwick Ram Legacy member of the, of the Wild Sheep Foundation. I will host this tape seminar. The purpose is to enjoy fun and funny experiences from our organization's most experienced and colorful mountain and sheep, mountain sheep and goat hunters. Uh, it is intended for enjoyment and inspiration. Our three accomplished and very colorful hunters, uh, they're joining this session. There are three of, of the seven and the second group, if you will, of this seminar. Uh, from left to right, Please meet Dennis Dale. Dennis is the owner of Bob Dale Gloves and Imports uh, with head offices in Alberta. And he has, also has locations in Phoenix and Sri Lanka. They manufacture and supply industrial and recreational gloves across North America. He's, he's an avid hunter and wildlife enthusiast. He first began hunting at age nine, learning his skills from his uncle, an experienced trapper and moose hunter. His first sheep was at the age of 39 and was from Marco Polo in Tajikistan. Talk about starting at the top of the world. <laughs> uh, since that time, Dennis has shot 28 sheep from all over the world and nine goats. Uh, he, uh, he is a Summit Life member and a Marco Polo Society member of the Wild Sheep Foundation. Dennis is active and currently sits on two boards, Ethics for the Wild Sheep Foundation and Bear Trust International. In addition to his time, he has a strong passion for wildlife conservation and donates to multiple wildlife organizations around the world. Dennis has received countless awards honoring trophy sheep. He holds two slams in the Over 700 Club and also has been recognized at the Wild Sheep Foundation for Conservationist of the Year. If you meet with Dennis in person, you'll quickly realize that his pipe and laughter is a huge part of his personality, and he always loves to share stories uh, about times on the mountain. Next over is Rex Baker, and Rex will, Rex will be a name that most of you will already recognize. Uh, Rex calls Alberta, excuse me, Atlanta home, but also spends time in North Carolina and Florida. His first big game hunt was uh, on the Spetsese Plateau in BC, 1976. He collected a stone sheep, a mountain goat, mountain caribou, Western Canada moose, and a wolf. It was a 10-day horseback uh, pack-in and included, including the charter cost was $3,500. I really wish you wouldn't have shared that, Rex. It hooked him. He's collected 85 wild sheep and 44 wild goats. This amounts to five Fanaws uh, Grand Slams, seven Ovis World Slams, three Capra World Slams. Uh, he turns 80 in June and has three North American sheep hunts and four international Capra hunts this fall. My hero. He's been fortunate to have been honored with the Wild uh, Sheep Foundation Mountain Hunter Hall of Fame Award, the Ovis Award, the Weatherby Award, SCI's International Hunter of the Year Award, Golden Malik Award, Dallas Safari Club, the uh, President's Cup, and the Ovis uh, Super 40 and Capra Super 30. 
and he's also founder of the Conklin Award. He's a uh, Wild Sheep Foundation Summit uh, Summit Life member. He feels like a, he's a very lucky and blessed guy to, to have had his family support him through all these uh, mountain journeys. Uh, third, uh, third over is Peggy Lee from Modesto, California. Peggy hunted her first sheep in the, in the year 2000, was for a, a stone sheep and she, she came back empty, but was right back at it in 2001, a stone sheep with Collingwood Brothers. Uh, since then, she's taken 14 sheep and 15 wild goats. She, in terms of recognition, she has the Utah State Record uh, Desert Bighorn. Uh, from it was done in 2001. She's uh, got the first Echelon Ullman Award, uh, the Outstanding Animal of the Year, British Columbia 2008, uh, Utah Full Curl Hall of Fame 2014, and a world record Bukharan Markor from 2019. She is a Summit Life member of the Sheep Foundation. Interesting fact uh, is, uh, is a story around James John. Uh, her first actual hunt arranged by her late husband to make sure she could uh, you know, deal emotionally with actually shooting an animal uh, was in New Mexico on one of Ted Turner's ranches and it was for antelope. She was the only, only woman and they only had a men's bathroom. So they let her use Jane's John as in Jane Fonda. She <laughs> felt very special. Turns out Jane Fonda loved to bird hunt, uh, thus why she had her own John on the ranch. Uh, Peggy guesses that uh, in Jane's mind, it was okay to kill birds, just not animals, because apparently she wouldn't even let uh, the ranch hands shoot a rattlesnake as she was opposed to killing, go figure. So if you would, please, uh, please welcome all three of our icons of, of sheep hunting. And we'll, we'll get started with the interviews. The, the first question I'm going to ask for a response on, and Dennis, you're going to be the first call, is sure. what's your funniest personal experience on a sheep or goat hunt? My funniest personal, I have lots of funny stories to share and uh, personal experiences, but one of my favorites was uh, hunting the Alberta Premier Tag. And uh, there was a couple of funny experiences that happened, but the first one was my guides, we'd hunted 31 straight days in Cataman and, and uh, we had some uh, plywood decoys that we had made. We had them air airbrushed and coming out of there for the last day, the boys decided to use those as, as uh, snowboards and snowboard down the mountain. And needless to say, they were going to have a, a bet for 50 bucks to see who could, who could win the race. And they both ended up in the trees on their head with scratches and rips. It was pretty funny. But then the next day uh, was this, or two days later was the start of a hunt, uh, the same hunt, but in a Kananaskis area. And we literally took a uh, ski lift up the hill and there was a Canadian uh, women's downhill championship going on. So they were all taking the ski lift in their, in their spandex and helmets that were all designed for speed and everything. And here we were going up in camouflage with our backpacks. <laughs> and so, we, we went up and they all looked at us like we we're crazy team TV cameras on us and everything. And, and we continued to climb up over the backside and hunt on the backside of the mountain for the day. And uh, we're very lucky and fortunate and able to, uh, to harvest a great ram. And uh, on the way down, we skied past the, the uh, where they were competing and uh, Jonas Gwynn and Ryan Damstrom, both took turns carrying the head on their back and all <laughs> TV cameras and, and tall video on them. And uh, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. And by the time we got down, there was, you know, women that had, had got their times and finished and the news kind of came over our way and people were taking pictures of this ram on the back of their backs. It was just, I never stopped laughing for probably three days after that. It was a great, funny experience. So great times. I love it. I love it. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, Peggy, how about you? Uh, well, this was when I was uh, widowed, so I didn't have a lot of support in terms of being smart, you know. My late husband was the avid hunter all, you know, since he was a little thing. But 
I'd hunted, you know, I had my slam by then and I fished and hunted with Ray Collingwood um, a number of times. And I said, I want a goat. I want a mountain goat. And Ray said, I want to take one with you. So I'm on my way to the airport, literally on my driving my way. I've been on a lot of, you know, horse pack hunts, not a big deal. Right. And so you kind of keep all your stuff already packed up. Right. So I um, literally in the car, just going over my little list, making sure everything's in the car with me that I'm gonna put on the plane. There is there is a statement there I never read. It's not a freaking horse pack. It's a backpack hunt. I mean, it's a big difference what you pack, you know? <laughs> I've never been on a backpack hunt before. <laughs> so, Needless to say, when I got to Smithers, finally, they do have an absolute amazing sporting goods store. So I shucked all, you know, the, the wool stuff and everything. And God, I found some wonderful down stuff. <laughs> what a difference. I never had down, you know, hunting because I never had to carry it on my back before <laughs> for days and days. But um, the whole hunt was... That was just the start of it. it. I mean, I love Ray. I love him to death. And God bless him. He's a mountain goat himself. I mean, people probably know that, that, that have ever hunted with him. <laughs> so he, we are determined. And I remember at one point, it was getting frustrating because he'd be like a mile ahead of me. And I would just be sitting down eating jelly beans for the energy. You know, it's like, stop. Anyway, um, Finally, he said after a number of days, uh, look, there's a beautiful one right here. It's beautiful. Look at the horns. They're going to be over 10 inches. And I said, okay. He said, it's a nanny. I go, a nanny? I don't want to shoot a girl. I don't want to shoot a girl. And Ray said, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good nanny. So I said, oh, golly whatever so by then it was really blowing frosting freezing and i was going into hypothermia i was shaking so bad ray just pulled me off the gun I said forget it <laughs> so i didn't get the nanny so but eventually i got one on that hunt and it fell in the crevasse and then it, i'm sure that's happened the hunters were gee, especially goat or mountain goats shoot there's no way to scale that so we had to call his um, his son. He flew in, you know, the little lake we were on, and then he became Spider Man. He literally scaled that and had to uh, dress it up there and, and throw down the hide and the horns in a, in a you know in a ball that went all the way down, and then throw the meat that he brought a bag up down, you know, thousands of feet. <laughs> But um, yeah, that was my first also scope experience because uh, the goat was straight up and we were straight down and I had no clue. I didn't know I could scope myself. Ray looks at me and is, he starts laughing. Oh, it's so funny. He's down, the goat's down, what do you want? And he said, nothing, nothing. He wouldn't tell me until I saw pictures, you know? It's like, come on. So, you know. You won't be the first person who had more blood on your face than the, than the goat had on him. I mean, I, yeah, that, that, those uphill shots, you got to be aware of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, yeah. Peggy. Uh -huh. the next question is, what's the funniest guide client story that either you've experienced or you know it from someone else? And Rex, why don't you start us off there? I think you've got one about Rowdy McBride, don't you? Yeah. Most of y'all know Rowdy McBride, and if, if you don't know him, uh, you should. He's a great hunter. He's hunted all over the world on his own. Uh, he hunts Audad and Afghan Uriel and Red Sheep on hundreds of thousands of acres down by Alpine, Texas. And we're, I've hunted several times with him, and we were out in one of his pastures and pulled up to the bottom of a bluff and we started glassing. Well, we find sheep. They're maybe about 300 feet up, maybe seven, 800 yards down the bluff. It's getting late. So we gotta go fast and we gotta go light. So we just grabbed the gun and we had his 11 year old son, Ryland with us. 
up we go, hide hill, find the sheep, make the shot. Oh, they're tough. They runs down on the rocks. By the time we find the sheep, take the pictures, keep it out, it's dark. We hadn't bought a day pack. We're using Rowdy's phone to come off the bluff. Ryland's in front with a cactus in the rock. Rowdy's next, and I'm last. And at that point, just about the time Rowdy's phone gives out, we hit the bottom. Now we're in the flats, and we can't find the truck. We walk. We can't use my phone because my battery is almost dead. And we walk. And it's getting cold. It's probably in the 40s. And we hadn't really brought much gear. Finally, Rowdy texts his wife, Misty. We're lost in antelope pastures. Send help. We just finally have to stop walking and uh, sit down, lay down about 3, 3.15. We see lights come into the uh, pasture. And we see where they're going. So we quick gumboot it as fast as we can down, try to cut the track, and we do. And Rowdy says, Rex, I've been hunting out here for a long time. But he says, it's the first time I've ever had to spend the night on the mountain. That's my story about Rowdy. <laughs> Thanks, Rex. It, it kind of reminds me of a story about Daniel Boone. And late in life, he was interviewed. And, uh, and the interviewer was saying, well, you know, geez, Daniel, you've explored all, all this country. Have you ever been lost? And he pauses for a bit and, and he thinks and kind of looks down, looks up, goes, nope, nope. I have never been lost. Never, not even once. He said, I have been powerful confused sometimes <laughs> for a week at a time, but I have never been lost. That's perfect. That sounds kind of like that. So Dennis, how about you and the funniest guide client story? You know, again, I, like I talked about uh, the, uh, the stories with Jonas and Ryan, and I've had multiple uh, stories with them doing, you know, crazy stuff on the mountain. Um, I've had a similar situation where, I was hunting one time and we got into a snowstorm and, uh, and I'll use this from you, Rex. It was, it was snow so bad and, and we hadn't been prepared. We, we went out for the day, you know, chasing animals and thinking that we were going to be back yeah. to where we had safe safety, um, with plenty of time and plenty of gear. And so we got to the point where, uh, one of the guys, we literally, we're 10 feet apart in the snowstorm and we were communicating via um, the, uh, what do you call them? Um, you know, the GPS uh, eye reaches, the in reach. And uh, we're literally 10 feet apart and couldn't see each other. That's how bad the storm was. And we were yelling and the wind was so bad and we still, and we literally had to walk into one another to be able to find ourselves and then try and get home. And, and, we were in a spot where these guides knew, you know, they knew it like the back of their hand. And yet we had a heck of a time, but we did make it back. We didn't have to spend the night on the mountain. So that was nice, but uh, it was a heck of a, a scary thing for me really. And uh, you know, I've been, I've been out there a few times. One of the, I'll say, I know this is not a funny story, but one of the uh, best guides I've ever been with was Bart Lancaster. He's like a, to be able to be in the bush in the dark and find his way back to where you originally left from was something of a miracle with that guy. That's the one I've had a lot of instances in my life where I've been with guides that totally impress me and, and really blow me away with their, their capability and, and being able to keep me safe and, and our, you know, all of us in a safe environment, but Bart Lancaster, um, we were on a Kluani hunt and, and he literally brought us right back to, we were using quads and razors at the time and how he got back through them, through the bush in the dark, in the middle of nowhere. And these things were parked in the bush, blew us all away. All of us, there was probably six guides there and they were all blown away. So um, 
I've had some funny stories and I've definitely had some, some interesting ones too. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. So I'm pretty sure that all, all of you have uh, sheep fever. So the question really is, how would you describe it? And Dennis, I wanna, I wanna have you start that off again. Okay, for me, you know, I, you know, it's, it's something, I've always had a thrill about hunting in my life. I, you know, my, I don't have any other family uh, besides my son now that hunted. So my father wasn't a hunter. Nobody in my family was a hunter. And, and I started hunting and, and I always had this, this goal of pushing myself when I hit 40 years old to do something that would challenge me internally, physically, mentally. And that's why I went on the Marco Polo hunt for my first hunt. I lost 41 pounds, worked out, got ready and read books and Jack O'Connor's books and, and literally thought I was ready for the experience. I truly did. I thought in every way. And as I got there, it truly became euphoric in some way. It was almost, and, an, you know, I'm religious to a, to a point, but walking through there, I felt like a disciple walking through the mountains. And I was, I remember talking to myself saying, this is absolutely the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life and the most difficult. And I was proud of myself to push my body in that regard. And so from that point, every single day, this, this sheep fever that overwhelms you and people warned me about it, but I had no idea. It starts to build from the, and I can only describe it. It's from the pit of your soul. And, you know, and it's, and I'm not a thoroughbred. I'm not built like some of these sheep hunters that are ripped. I'm more of a pack horse. So, you know, but it's, it's that internal switch that, that goes within you that says I can do this and I can push myself. And that becomes an ember deep inside that just, you can't control for all of us. And the money you spend, I remember thinking, this is, you know, I'll never spend this money again. And I couldn't wait to book my next hunt. So I mean, it just, it's such an addiction to challenge yourself mentally, physically, emotionally, you know, and in every which way. So that's, it's, it's a fever like no other. Thank you, Dennis. So, so Rex, you, uh, you, you've been bit really bad based on the numbers. <laughs> so uh, what do you got to say about sheep fever? Well, there is a disease and it's called Ovis pyrexia. <laughs> Okay. Which translates into sheep fever. And Dennis hit it on the head. There's a challenge, but there's a lot more than that. There's, there's the travel. You go places you'd never go. There's the adventure. There's the unknowing. When you drive on the Karakoram Highway, I mean, who's going to go on the Karakoram Highway unless you're going to go hunt Marco or Ibex? Um, you get to see the best of the countries because normally when you go into these countries, you're met by some pretty connected people and they get you into the private clubs and you see some of the very best parts of the capital. And then you see the most remote parts of the world, the wilderness that there are. Uh, I love being above tree line. I love glassing. It's uh, uh, it is a way of life. And people have asked me. They said, "Rex, if you hunt sheep, I said, are you a professional sheep hunter?" And I said, "Oh no, no." I said, "If you have enough money to hunt sheep, and you didn't like to hunt sheep." No one has enough money to pay you to hunt sheep. And that's my definition of sheep fever. Thank you, Rex. Okay, I, this next one uh, should be really fun as well. That's, uh, I want each of you to tell, uh, tell us about the strangest meal you've eaten or been offered in a sheep camp. And uh, Rex, let's start with you on that. Did you say Rex? Yes, please. Oh. We're hunting the Koryak up in uh, northern Siberia in August with Al and Sharon Means, a couple of really good sheep hunters. Or Alan is and Sharon goes. 
And we have a couple of days we don't find what we want. So stash, and I think anybody that's hunted in that part of Siberia is hunted with stash. He, he says, if you can go light backpack halfway to the next camp, I know there's sheep there. I said, well, how far is that? He says, about 12 miles. Oh, we gotta go light. I said, okay, we go. So the next day we take off, no sleeping bags and just roll. By the time we get there, we're soaking wet. We come into the basin where we're gonna camp and sure there are sheep there, we shoot a sheep. So we dress the sheep, we get in the tent, we're still wet. We haven't changed out of our wet clothes into the one set of dry clothes to sleep in. We're still wet. They carry that old Russian stove that's about almost as big as a record player. And he has a two, gal two pound coffee can. We cut the heart and the liver up. There's plenty of water. We put water in that can and ramen noodles. And we boil that up and ate it out of the can with our knives. And it was wonderful. <laughs> and then we had three guys, no sleeping bag in a two man tent. Got up the next morning, put our wet clothes back on in case we didn't make it back to camp and walked 12 miles back to camp. That's my meal story. Fantastic, thanks Rex. Peggy? Tell us about your strangest meal. <laughs> well, it's it didn't have horns, um, but there was a reason I really was adamant to get this animal, but I had to buy another property home in another state just to be able to bring it there, which is the mountain lion. You know, thank you, Jane Fine, Tom Hayden, and 117, <laughs> Prop 117. Anyway, so I'm, Stuart Maiden, I love him too. Um, great trapper, and he, he also is a mountain man, so he knows his his furry animals. So I said, Stuart, you know, let's go on a mountain or a mountain lion hunt, no problem. And with the dogs, that was such a fun experience. Anyway, I also believe in as a you know ethical moral that what you do harvest unless there's something wrong with it parasites or something um you know it's you eat it well we got this <laughs> huge mountain lion and, and and you know it's huge 15 and 2 16 it's huge um so we get it back to his home and uh, he said, okay, we're gonna eat a goat. Excuse me, where are gonna eat a cat? <laughs> but guess what, um, shoot. His wife made a chili out of it. Oh my God, it was outstanding. <laughs> so never say never, always try. And you know what? It probably is just like Rex, delicious. And it really, it's just like chicken, it was white meat. <laughs> So that's it. <laughs> I Thank ate a cat. You. Thank you, Peggy. Dennis, tell us about I've had lots of instances where my guides uh, challenge me to try different parts of the animal. So I've, I've eaten everything from the testicles and onward. But um, I would say that I was warned um, uh, multiple of times. I've been uh, to Mongolia three times now. And, and a few of my friends said, don't eat the marmot. It's, uh, you know, it gets you sick and it's not something you want to eat. And, and on the last hunt I was there, um, we had a great celebration. We got a great ram and, and they had a, a marmot that they were cooking. And if anybody's ever saw that, they use a torch to cook it with the hair and they do all that. And it just does not look like anything you'd ever want to put in your mouth whatsoever. And uh, they spend all day on it. And that evening they were celebrating. And, you know, I said I wanted to pass, but the pressure got to me and a couple of wines later celebrating. And, and I finally partook and it was actually a really really good animal to to eat and it wasn't a, it wasn't tough to eat at all I enjoyed it and I never got sick so you know you never I guess never say never because you never know what you're going to like and uh you know it's uh I've eaten I've even eaten bird saliva tarts you know <laughs> so every 
travel the world, you get some really crazy things. So <laughs> very good. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, next I want to hear about your most agonizing miss. And Rex, I think you've got uh, you've got a, one to tell us, maybe two. Well, you're right. You're right, Mike. I'm back in the '80s. I'm hunting Pakistan uh, along with uh, Dr. Jim Conklin. He was he was my mentor and a, and a great friend. And we're hunting Blandford Uriel. Both of us see this Blandford Uriel, and he's huge. And both of us, Jim. Jim didn't suffer from a lack of competitiveness and, and neither do I. Both of us are drawn down on this sheep and we just totally miss this sheep. Don't, don't cut a hair. And we know it's big. And the next hunter in was Gary Ingersoll. He goes to the same place. We couldn't find that sheep again. The next hunter ends Gary Ingersoll. He find, goes to the same place, finds the sheep, shoots it, new world's record. That's just one. I'm hunting Pakistan again. Aster Markor, 640 yards, can't get any closer, big chasm between us. I'm shooting a bar gun. We have the picture of the animal through the spot. So I know the size of that animal. I miss him with the barred gun. He runs away. Nobody ever killed him. He probably died up there. They never found anything. And uh, I, I'll bet you the cost of the hunt, you look at the picture, you tell me it's not the new world's record. So I've missed two world's records. Thanks, Rex. Peggy, tell us about your most agonizing miss. Uh, my late husband, avid sheep hunter and um so he i went with him on his espionage and then i finished I, then he said okay now it's your turn so he wanted me to do something really special so he bought basically like the governor's tag in utah and oh you know how it is when you get one of those people work their butts off all summer long scouting and everything uh and they kind of pretty well, you know, help you to know where, where we're going to be looking. So sure enough, you know, after a few days, we found the guy and um, he was bedded down and it was kind of warm. It was right on the border of uh, Nevada and Utah in the Virgin River area. And, um, you know, you're sitting there ready any second he gets up. Well, again, I was a novice. That was my second sheep in my whole, or my second, yeah, in my whole life. So it was about an hour and they were kind of giving me sips of water as I was just sitting there, not moving, you know, from just, if he's standing, I just pull. Well, after about an hour or so in that baking sun, finally <laughs> he, he gets up and the guy goes, shoot. And I go, totally missed. I mean, you know, these people put in months and months and months of work. <laughs> oh my God. And, and, and nobody said a word because it was about, you know, it was all guys and nobody said a word. <laughs> and I just started crying. <laughs> I started crying. I was so upset. I started crying and I said, I hate this. Why are you making me do this? I, I mean, I disappointed everybody. I'm so sorry. Well, after about an hour of me feeling sorry for myself, nobody said anything. I go, do you think we could find him again? <laughs> and they go, yes. <laughs> so we did a one shot kill when we got him and it was a happy ending for a, a very terrible abyss. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Thanks, Peggy. Dennis, <laughs> what do you have to say about an agonizing miss? Well, you know, I'll, I'll say this, you know, it's interesting when you get to camp, the guides always ask you the same thing. I've been asked multiple times, how comfortable are you? What, what distance are you comfortable shooting? And I always say, well, I'm really comfortable at 25 yards, but I can shoot out past 500. So, but my actual uh, nightmare, I'll call it of a, of a miss was last year on uh, my second high altide, which I can say that he ended up being, I, I ended up killing him. Uh, 61 and a half 
inch long and 21 and a half inch bases. So beautiful round. So I'm, I'm only saying that because you can imagine it was day two. Um, I actually had the round on day one at 40 plus yards. My guide spooked him, took off and I couldn't get a shot at him till out past 800 on a dead run. So we passed up that opportunity. Day two, I uh, walked 48,000 steps that day. It's on my, on my uh, watch. It was a record for me. I thought I was going to die. My heart went up to 180 and the watch is vibrating and telling me to stop, slow down. It's, I'm going to have a heart attack. But anyway, I finally got to him just before dark, 200 yards broadside. He's, you know, a no brainer shot. And I, my guide says, there he is. And I said, yeah. He said, do you know which one it is? Because there was a band of about 10 rounds. I said, yeah, I got him. No problem. Put my gun up on a rock. Like we couldn't put the pack up because he had us dead to rights. We were on a side slope. And so I put my gun on the rock and I said, all I see is dirt and rocks. I need something on my gun. I, d I don't have a tripod on my gun. So, so he, so, uh, and the guy didn't understand me. And my interpreter was too far back because he didn't want to get spotted. And so I'm telling him, I got to lift my gun. I, I need something to go underneath my gun. So I took my hand and I made a fist, put the gun on it. Well, any of you, Rex, I'm sure you know this. And this is a huge lesson for all young hunters or, or old hunters or, and everybody in between. My scope had a clear vision of the animal because it was above. But my barrel didn't. So I made what I believed was the perfect shot. He's dead, you know, boom, squeeze off. I think I got him. My guide says, shoot again. I said, I don't need to. He's going to die. And, and he's like, I said, it was, it was that good. It felt that good. He goes, you hit four feet in front of us, shoot again. And by that point, he was gone. It took us another eight days and a lot more steps before I finally got a shot at him. And I hit him at 611 yards. So, you know, it, that, that one really, really uh, haunts me. But God – God bless the fact that we were able to harvest that ram, but I, I learned a big, big lesson that day. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. So, so this next question uh, is a little different direction, but, but uh, is going to be very popular, I believe. And, and the question is this, what wisdom can you share with, uh, with sheep hunting fans that are in the less than one club, be it the less than one of anything or the less than one international club? Dennis, why don't you start us on that? Sure, I'd love to. Um, the, the, most, the most important thing I could give to share with anybody that's going out and in a, is in a less than one club, and maybe it's their first sheep hunter, or maybe the multiple hunts, but they haven't had an opportunity to harvest ram, is treat your guides like your family. Treat, treat them as good as you want to be treated, if not better. Because without them, you're not going to harvest the thing. And be humble. Um, I go into sheep camp. I tell them we're just like any other hunt in the world. I, I can pull my weight as long, you know, as well as you can. We're, we're a team. We're going to harvest whatever we harvest together as a team. And if you treat them with respect and you treat them the way you wanted to be treated and not as a, as a servant or, a, or, you know, uh, I mean, they're, they're there to make you, to get you a ram and without them and if they don't like you or they don't like your attitude because you feel you've paid this money that you've saved up for the last 10 years and that they should bend over backwards for you you are not going to have a great hunt and uh but if you go in there and you you express the fact that you've you know spent your last nickel and you just want to be a part of the team and that you're a team you'll you'll harvest a great ram that's that's my wisdom for you thank you dennis thank you how about you Wisdom. I know, I know, uh, Dennis. I never even thought about that about, but um, respecting your guys because they work their butts up. They give their lives. I mean, really. So I concur with you, Dennis. Okay. <sighs> patience, <laughs> uh, patience, and um, because I don't know what the statistics are, but I don't think that it is certainly not 100%, it wasn't for me. Your first sheep hunt, a lot of money, a lot of invested of your own time getting in shape and then not either missing or not having an opportunity. Patience. Um, that first year of my sheep hunt that I got skunked, <laughs> I got frostbite, I 
you know, it's 14 days later, no sheep. <laughs> but the next year I went back, I went back and it was so freaking hot the same time of year, short sleeve t-shirts, climbing, sweating, but that's what you're given. So that's that I think my wisdom advice is don't ever give up, even if it takes you five times to finally get that first sheep or goat. It will happen, but it takes you. It takes you as an individual to persevere. That's what it's about. And if you want it bad enough, everybody that you're working with on your team has worked very hard. So you're not alone there. And don't give up. Thanks, Thank you. Rex, what can you share with us? First, I want to make a comment about what Dennis said. It's so true. Guides a lot of time are country people and they're, they're kind of taciturn and kind of quiet. Right in the middle of a, maybe a long pull on the mountain, I'll say, you know, I said, there's only one smart guy on this mountain. And then I won't say anything else. Well, he doesn't say anything. So we climb another hour or whatever, and I don't say anything. He doesn't say anything. Finally, by the time we get to the top, it's killing him. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, obviously, you're smarter than me because you're getting paid for this. So <laughs> anyway, uh, now, but back to the question. One word, research. Research kills big animals. It also has a demonstrated effect on your success rate. Bighorns are one of the most expensive sheep, not because of what it costs for one hunt, but many times it takes twice to go on a bighorn. There are very few bargains. I've been lucky to pick good outfitters, the best outfitter you can get. And if you have to wait a year or two, wait a year or two, book it, go hunt something else. I used to think that we didn't have, you had to have pass fail on, on physical. I'm not the most physical guy in the world. Pass fail on, on shooting ability. I'm not the best shot in the world. But you have to go with the right guide at the right time. He's already in the right place. And with that, you will get great animals with a high success rate. I wanna wind up with, with something that was really important to me. I read a book called Deep Survival, and it was about deaths and, and near deaths and mountaineering and sailing and scuba and, and, and hunting, things like that. When you're climbing a mountain, you have a goal. You're also usually fresh. Plus, you don't have a weight shift on your uphill foot. Now you've made your climb, it's in the afternoon. You're starting down. You're usually fatigued. But more important than that is you don't have a goal. Just getting back to camp's not a goal. Or maybe you got your sheep, so you're free baby. So you don't have a focus. And every step you take, you have a weight shift on your unstable foot. When you get into a gnarly situation, be it either on the Caucasus, which are probably the worst mountains in the world, or on, on wet rocks on the Appalachian Trail, when I get in those situations, I have a mantra. I say, focus, focus, focus. And all of a sudden, my senses sharpen up. I have a goal. I'm watching where I put my feet. I'm almost 80 years old and I don't fall because of that mantra. That's probably the best advice I can give the new sheep hunters. Thank you. Thank you, Rex. And thanks, thanks uh, each of you. The, uh, before we, we actually leave, uh, is there anything else anyone really wants to share or ask each other? 
Oh my I'll just say thanks, Rex. I appreciated your comments and Peggy. Uh, pleasure to meet you guys. And Mike, thanks for facilitating. Um, and then I'll let you two go ahead. But Mike, again, thank you. Um, and I have no idea why I'm part of this group because you, you gentlemen are amazing. <laughs> totally true. I had. I mean, I guess if I could inspire somebody that's kind of a newbie, that's me. I mean, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, geez, I, but I'm in awe of both of you and your accomplishments. Wow. And I'm just, you know, I'm going to be 70 in a few years. So, you know, Rex, and I, I don't feel it. And I'm sure you don't. And that's the other thing is don't ever let that, don't ever let a number mess with you. Just keep doing what you love doing. That's cheap honey. Mike? Yes, Rex. Thanks. Thanks for your time. With, we're in such troubled times with no conventions. First time since 76 that I've ever seen something like this. Anyway, thanks. This was a good idea. Uh, thank you for allowing me to participate.